welcome to another video in which I will forge a Viking broadsax. The sax was a single-edged sword primarily used in Anglo-Saxon times. However, it also was still common in the early Viking era. While many saxes were of basic quality, easily produced by many blacksmiths, I am aiming for a high-quality pattern-welded sax that would have been quite expensive. This sword was a long time in the making and there were many failures and painful setbacks. This video is the culmination of over a year of work and has been edited for brevity. You can find much more detail in the broad sax video series. So far I have cut a lot of 6 inch pieces of 1075 and 15 and 20 tool steel. I will put alternating pieces of steel into 9 layers total. That is 5 layers of 1075 and 4 layers of 15 and 20. If this is all alien to you, let me explain more. 1075 is a reasonably plain carbon steel that will etch dark when put into ferric chloride. 15 and 20 on the other hand contains a lot of nickel and will stay quite bright in comparison to the 1075. As a result, when forging out such a billet, you would see 9 alternating lines of different color in the steel. While this sometimes makes for an interesting pattern, in this case I will also twist the steel to create a chevron pattern as you will discover if you keep watching this video. Interestingly, as you watch me assemble these billets, the different layers of steel look about the same. This will continue to be the case until the very end. However, the pattern will get revealed immediately when etching the sacks, leading to an almost magical moment. The MIG welds I added to keep the billet together will not be part of the finished sword and so I do not have to worry about them contaminating the pattern. The steel here will be used for the middle of the sax. For the cutting edge I will be doing something different and the very back of the sword I usually construct with wrought iron or a mild steel. The three billets of nine layer steel that I created need to be welded in the forge fire. This requires high temperatures, clean material and the right atmosphere in the propane forge. All the work on the power hammer is to draw the billets out until they are roughly 3 eighths of an inch square. It's about 9 millimeters. There is a lot of forging work that needs to happen before the final dimension is reached. I usually first forge the bars to 3 quarters of an inch and then to 1 half an inch before going for the final dimension. Since these bars will get stacked on top of each other to form the sax blade, it's important that the surfaces are square. The bar is now at 3 quarters of an inch square and occasional normalizing of the steel helps with obtaining a more fine-grained homogeneous structure and may also help with creating stronger welds. A thousand years ago, this process would have required several helpers who would constantly work the bar with heavy hammers. This may also give you a sense for why swords were highly priced and only affordable by a small part of the populace. So far, I created two long square bars with nine layers of 1075 and 15 and 20. My bars for constructing swords or saxes are always 3 eighths of an inch wide, that's about 9 millimeters. To create a herringbone pattern in the middle of the blade, I will twist one of the bars to the left and the other to the right. My twisting jig makes this quite easy, but before I can use it, I need to weld the bars to little steel squares that fit the jig. I often wonder how blacksmith a thousand years ago would have gone about twisting these bars. I have not seen any fines or specialized tools for twisting, but find it hard to believe they would just have used tongs. The other tool that really helps with twisting is the oxyacetylene torch, which provides a mobile and high temperature heat source. I'm using a rosebud and need to dial in the acetylene and oxygen until I get the right flame. Even twists of these layered bars are important to me since I want an even pattern on the finished blade. To achieve even twists, I heat up a couple of inches of the bar and apply two complete rotations and then move on to the next couple of inches by making sure there is a slight overlap to the previous section. Since the twisted bars need to be forged welded back to a square, I also make sure to remove any obvious scale with a wire brush. As you can see, I'm twisting the first bar to the right. While not entirely intuitive, these directional twists are orientation invariant. That means no matter which way you flip the bar, the direction of the twists will always look the same. This also means to get a herringbone pattern, we need different twist directions. For that reason, I will twist the next bar to the left. All right, the first bar is completely twisted. If you take a close look, you will see how the twists have a slant to the right. Keep that in mind when you look at the slant for the next bar, which I will be twisting left. 
Perhaps counterclockwise would be a more appropriate term here. I have gotten quite lucky here that none of the bars sheared. The next step is to clean off any scale so that it can be forge welded back to square. Here is a close look at one of the bars. Observe the chamfer on the edges, which reduces the stress on the bar when twisting. Before I can put the bars back into the forge, I need to remove the little metal squares I used to fit the bars into my twisting jig. As the bars are round now, I need to re-establish a square profile and I'm using a spacer and the power hammer to maintain the same dimension across the whole length of the bar. Again, it is important to get the bars hot enough to weld and to keep oxygen away from them, for which I'm using borax as a flux again. Here is a quick look at the bars after they have been forge welded back to square. As it is difficult to visualize the pattern, here is a sneak peek at a computer generated visualization. It shows one of these twisted bars at different levels of material removal and you can see how the pattern develops as the bars get thinner. To create these patterns in a sort, I will assemble the bars into a sort by forge welding them together. As you saw earlier, during forge welding multiple separate steel pieces are fused together with strong hammer blows at high temperatures. This process requires that the steel is very clean and not oxidized. Forge welding a long sort is particularly difficult because the surface area is narrow but also very long. As a result, this step is difficult to complete successfully. I am now working on the edge billet. This is very similar to the material I forge welded before. At this point in the video, I have a 100 layer billet for the cutting edge that needs to be forged out. I am doing this on the power hammer with drawing dies which allow me to quickly elongate the billet. As I am making a broad sax, I need to create a fairly wide edge billet. It consists of W2, a high carbon tool steel, and some wrought iron for a total carbon content of roughly 0.7%. Even with the power hammer, the drawing operation takes time. My technique with the power hammer is to mount spacers that allow me to reduce the stock to the thickness of the spacer. To reduce scaling from oxygen exposure, I remove the scale with a wire brush and apply some additional borax as flux. I forge the billet to square and reduce the size of the spacer. Eventually, I will have worked the steel down to one half inch square or about 12.7 millimeters. Just imagine doing all of this by hand. After having spent hours at the hot forge fire and the power hammer, the work enters a certain rhythm and becomes almost meditative. It is a good break from everyday life and completely disconnected from our busy schedules and frequent interruptions. After a lot of work, I sometimes give the steel a rest and let it cool down. It gives me a little rest as well. I am now at the final dimension of the billet and will forge it flat on one side to widen it. To help with that, I put a 3 8 inch 9mm spacer under the power hammer. If you did not watch the detailed episodes on the sword, you are probably unaware that what you are seeing here is my fifth attempt at creating the broad sucks. After a lot of trial and error, I ended up fixing my forge and also switched from using wrought iron to mild steel for the back of the sword. If you want to see me fail, take some time and watch the individual videos. The cutting edge and the core bars need to have squared up sides to ensure successful welding. To help with that, I verified that my tool rest and platen have a 90 degree angle. If the bars are not squared to each other, for example, because they are slanted, hitting them with a hammer will cause them to slide apart rather than welding together. Clamping the bars is a good way to check if they are square enough. If the bars are already trying to slide away from each other now, it is very likely that forge welding will fail. I sometimes need to go back to the grinder to make adjustments until I'm happy with how the bars hold together under clamp pressure. Once the bars are at forge welding temperatures, I set the weld with light taps from the power hammer. The liquid flux sprays away when the bars meet and helps preserve a clean surface for the weld. So far, it looks pretty good. On a side note, I have color graded this video in high dynamic range, and if you have a display that supports HDR10, 
the hot steel should really pop out on your screen. I think it all came together successfully. I will now heat up the welded bars to critical temperature and then let them cool down in the air to normalize them. If you watch carefully, you can see some recalcitrance, which is an increase in energy when the crystal structure and the steel changes. If you did not notice it, I will show it again later. At the moment, this looks quite ugly. Before I do any further forging, I will grind down the surface until it's completely flat and all gaps have disappeared. With a fresh belt on the belt sander, this happens quite quickly. Since this is a single edge blade, I need to establish a tip. My preferred method for that is to cut a reverse tip that needs to be forged back. The reason for doing that is to ensure that the pattern in the blade smoothly follows the blade edge. Creating a reverse tip is the method to do that. This is mostly an aesthetical consideration since I find patterns just running off the blade edge to be somewhat ugly. The reverse tip method has its own challenges. As you will see, forging back the tip is very hard on the welds. So this is also a good test to validate that the welds are solid. In this case, I will also test the cutoff piece to verify the welds. The shiny parts were welded and the dark parts were not. This is not a cause of concern though, because I already knew that there was a gap close to the tack weld that would not close up. It's time to forge the sword tip. I am forging the tip over very lightly. This creates a lot of stress on the welds and I really don't want them to open back up. After forging in the tip at the somewhat steep angle, I slowly adjust the profile of the blade so that it smoothly tapers to the tip. At this point in the process, I'm still trying to maintain a fairly even thickness of the material. Further tapering will happen as I forge in the bevels. The bevels create a thin cutting edge while maintaining a thick profile on the back of the sword. You may have noticed that the bars I assembled were not all of the same length. In particular, the material for the high carbon cutting edge was shorter. The bars that are sticking out will provide sufficient material for the tank. The blacksmith helper makes it easy to isolate the steel that I plan on drawing out to become the tang of the sword. As the dies are not completely even, it helps to rotate the steel and work from both sides. Under the power hammer, I can quickly draw out the isolated material and create a long tang. As I will be giving the sword away, I'm leaving the tang longer than I would normally make it, but it is easy to cut it shorter. While the power hammer allows me to work much faster, and in some sense makes it possible to be a single person sword maker, some adjustments by hand on the anvil are often needed. Swordsmithing is in many ways a very iterative process. I am now slowly forging out the bevels to establish the cutting edge of the single edge pattern welded sword. As you see me hitting the sword edge with the hammer, the sword develops a bend where it curves away from the cutting edge. This is due to the steel in the cutting edge expanding more than the steel at the back of the sword. It is an iterative process to straighten the sword back out first and then going back to forging the bevels which in turn will cause the saw blade to acquire a bend again. Single edge saxes have the broadest part of the blade at the base of the tang and gently taper towards the tip. When drawing out the bevels, I'm trying to make the blade as broad as possible. I repeat this process several times until I'm happy with the overall shape of the blade. As you can see, the tang is also getting bent, which is due to me exerting too much pressure with my left hand. With the pattern welded blade, I need to be careful to not distort the lines and work the blade as evenly as possible.
By hitting the blade on the edge with the back against the anvil, I can straighten out the bend that was introduced by drawing out the bevel. Another way to straighten the back would be to forge the back of the blade, but I want to keep that as thick as possible. When forging a sword, the actual time spent forging is much shorter than any other part of the process. However, time spent here can significantly reduce the time I have to be in front of the grinder. However, even then, what you see here on the video is only a short window into the overall forging time. Once I'm done with forging, I normalize the blade by bringing it up to critical temperature and letting it cool in the air. This relieves some of the stresses that were introduced when forging the blade. Watch again so you can observe the recalcitrance. For the beveled blade, you should see a hotter line moving through the blade as the change in crystal structure releases energy. After normalizing, it's time to take the blade to the grinder. First, I even out the lines, and then I will start working on thinning down the cutting edge. I am also using the grinder to refine my tank shape and even out the transition to the blade part of the sword. Once I'm happy with the profile, a few more adjustments are necessary to make the sword completely straight. Afterwards, I spent a lot of time to remove scale and hammer marks and to further thin down the blade. The push stick allows me to apply more pressure and to easily control where steel is being removed. As the sword has not been hardened yet, I don't have to worry about controlling the temperature. However, it gets quite hot after prolonged grinding and needs to be cooled in water occasionally. My final step before heat treating is to remove vertical grinder marks which could become stress risers. I do this by grinding along the length of the sword rather than perpendicular against it as you saw me doing before. I draw a file as the final pass to get rid of grinder marks and then I'm ready to heat treat the sword. My heat treating oven makes it much easier to get the sword to an even temperature, although if need be this could be achieved by stroking the blade through the forge as well. Before quenching the sword, I will normalize it one more time and give you another chance to observe recalcitrance. Once I'm done with normalizing, I place the sword into the heat treating oven again and bring it back up to critical temperature. This is also a good time to get ready mentally for quenching the sword. I will have to draw the sword quickly out of the oven and then plunge it straight into my high-speed quenching oil. To avoid a sharp transition in hardness at the tang, I move the sword up and down in the hope of creating a more gradual transition in hardness. It looks like the sword came out successfully and did not break. A potential problem could be a crack in the blade, but bending and warping are quite common as well. So, let's take a look. In terms of cracking, it looks rock solid. Starting in the middle, unfortunately, the blade developed quite a severe warp, both on the back and on the cutting edge. Despair not. I will show you my secret trick of fixing this the easy way. The trick requires a straight solid bar of steel and a bunch of little C-clamps. 
The idea is to straighten the whole blade against the completely straight bar and run another round of tempering. This is something I usually do after having already tempered the blade, which I'm not showing in the video here. If my memory serves right, I probably did the initial temper at 400 Fahrenheit or so. My final temper, which I'm showing here, will be at 550 degrees Fahrenheit, much higher than I would temper knives at, but this seems reasonable for a sword that needs to withstand a bunch of abuse. I usually temper for about an hour and then remove the blade. Because of the heavy steel bar, this requires some heavy gloves. In this case, the gloves were not quite thick enough, so I'm rushing to my bucket of water. Once I remove the clamps, I should be looking at a blade that is magically completely straight. Unfortunately, although such magic would be great, don't expect perfection. It should look much better though. This does indeed look much better, however it's not perfect and I will try to remove some of the remaining bend over the anvil. Once that is out of the way, it's time for my favorite activity standing in front of the belt sander for many, many hours. Since these many hours come with exposure to a lot of grinding dust, I'm wearing my powered respirator, which provides me with clean air. My goal in grinding here is to establish a flat surface from the back of the blade to the cutting edge, while also slowly thinning down the edge as well. As I am now working with the hardened blade, I need to watch the overall temperature and cool the blade down occasionally. The bucket of water is strategically placed next to the belt sander. Another aspect of sword making is the overall weight of the blade. I'm measuring it occasionally to see how much more material I want to remove. My overall goal is to produce a sword that weighs less than one kilogram, including guard and pommel. To get the sense of how much metal dust accumulates, let me show you my occasional cleanup of the floor. After frequent cooling and hours and hours of grinding, the sword is getting closer to its final weight. It's getting better, but still needs a little more work. Here's a close-up to see where more grinding is needed. Some spots on the back still need to be removed. Another technique I like to employ is grinding with the push stick, which forces the blade against the grinder much more aggressively. It also makes for a more even grind. Using C clamps to stand in for pommel and guard, I can measure the point of balance. It's going to be a few inches in front of the guard. Balancing can be tricky. The sax is almost done and just needs a little bit more polish. For giving the steel a matte finish that etches nicely, I prefer to use scotch Brite belts. As the grinder marks are mostly across the belt, grinding on the diagonal lets me see if there are any deep scratches left that need to be fixed. Fixing in this case means going to a different belt, as the scotch Brite belt does not really remove a lot of material. I just noticed an imperfection on the back of the blade and decide to go to a fine grit Trizac belt to fix the problem. With the new belt, fixing the small imperfection on the back of the blade is quick and quite easy. The video does not quite show it, but it was there. Once I'm happy with the fix, it's back to the scotch Brite belt. Now it's just a few more passes and then I'm done. Before etching, I prefer to run the grinder with the length of the blade. This is also another good check that no vertical sander marks from the more aggressive belts are left in the steel. Before etching, I want to make sure that the blade is free of any oils from handling it with my hands. I'm applying a general purpose natural cleaner and then do another pass just with plain water. This is usually sufficient to ensure an even edge across the whole blade. 
To suspend the blade in my ferric chloride solution, I'm taking a strip of leather and some vice grips to hold the sword firmly at the tank. This allows me to submerge the blade and just leave it hanging in the ferric chloride for about 20 minutes. In this case, I forgot slightly about time and left it in there for 25 minutes, which made for a pretty deep edge. You cannot really see anything on the video because the blade turned so black. First, I let the ferric chloride drip off the blade back into my container and then I'm using my general purpose cleaner and wipe everything off. For pattern welded blades, I have developed a very simple procedure for bringing out the pattern. After etching, I'm applying mother's metal polish to remove any remaining oxides. It first needs to be wiped on and then it needs to be completely wiped off. After the metal polish, I'm using fine steel wool as the final polishing pass. While steel wool by itself works well also, in addition to the steel wool, I'm using a mixture of oil and red iron oxide that I have mixed into a slurry. Here's the whole blade after polishing. The close-up of the blade shows you some of the pretty activity in the steel. The darker spots in the blade come from differential hardening where the shallow hardening steel did not quite react the same. To test the blade, I decided to put a temporary handle on it. I will not keep the sword myself, since it's a present to a friend who will create and put on his own fittings. To sharpen the blade, I grind in a secondary bevel on the slack belt. I was not quite sure how to test the blade and was also a little worried that the friction fit of the handle might come off. The garden and some water bottles seemed like a reasonable option. It's important to align the blade with your cutting angle. Let's see how I do. Let's try one more time. This seemed to work slightly better. In any case, the bottles are destroyed now and perhaps not the best cutting exercise object. Overall, the sword felt fine and the impact on hitting seemed okay as well. Looks pretty good to me. Cut all right as well. One of the things you saw in this video was me showing some visualizations of pattern welding that I have worked on over the last couple of years with the computer. And I liked the pictures quite a bit. So I ended up putting them on a t-shirt that you see me wearing here. Uh, if you like those, I'd welcome to follow the links in the description and order yourself a t-shirt. Otherwise, be on the lookout for a video that explains pattern welding in a lot of graphical detail for those of you who may struggle to see how these patterns come together just by watching my videos. So I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you like the graphics. And if you like them a lot, go get yourself one of these t-shirts and I will see you in another video very soon. Thanks to everyone on Patreon. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. See you next time.